Amen. Please uh, take your seat. Peter was saying that that, that took him back to him being a child. And, and I, I sung it as a child, but it reminded me the last time that I sung that song uh, was in, in a, a church in the east end of Glasgow. A uh, really tough area. And it was at something called Stourus. Uh, maybe you, you know that the word Stourus means cross in uh, Greek. And uh, all the people in the room... I think, apart from a couple of us, were recovering addicts or alcoholics. Uh, and they all sang that. Uh, and I remember one man with the tears running because uh, it wasn't theoretic for them. Uh, the only power that they had experienced that had set them free, uh, they traced back to the cross. And we want to pray that that same power is here tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and spirit that releases the power of the blood of Christ among us. And Lord, uh, we pray for your gospel, your word, to be powerfully at work among us tonight. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you were to come into to, to my study, you'd find uh, right at the back, these three bookcases with all those books. Uh, if you want the big word for it, they're all about something called ecclesiology. They're all about the church. And uh, they, they're all kind of fundamentally answering three questions. What is the church? Or four questions. What's Christian leadership? What's the church meant to do? What makes the church effective? And they're great questions, aren't they? And as a congregation, we need to know the answer to those questions. And there's lots of good stuff in those books. But you know, we were reminded tonight that the original answer to those questions is found right back in the very first description that we have of the church. That's what we've got in that chapter, or those two chapters that Roxanne led to us. We've got the very first answers to those questions that Paul gives us about what happened there in Thessalonica. And I'm amazed, just in three or four weeks, Paul was able to do and minister in a way that meant that these very young believers could withstand all the persecution and everything that Satan threw at them. And so I don't know about you, I want to find out what Paul did. I want to know how Paul ministered in that church that made them so spiritually strong so quickly. And what I'm going to suggest to you tonight is that he got a couple of things right. And things that we need to get right in the life of our church so that we can stand firm. We go back one. Oh, we're not doing well here. Excuse me, well. He got his purpose right. He got the leadership right and posture right. I mean, we're going to be thinking about this as we move on. It is here. So we're going to look at these four things and think about their implications for us as a church. And right here, Paul answers the, the kind of most fundamental question that we could ask. If we get this question right, the likelihood is that the rest of them will be right. And if we get this one wrong, everything else will be wrong. So what's the purpose of the church? Why do we exist? What's Westlake all about? Well, Paul says, on the contrary, we speak as people approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, and we're not trying to please people, but God who tests our heart. Paul says there that his number one priority, the single biggest purpose of the church, is that they please God. And everything that we do as a congregation, all of our ministries, this is our purpose. Our great calling and everything that we do is to please God. 
And that seems so simple, doesn't it? But let me tell you, after nearly three decades of church leadership, this is tough stuff. There is enormous pressure on us to do what pleases people. There's enormous pressure on us not to do certain things because we'll upset people. There's enormous pressure to do things just because they'll make people happy. And yet what Paul is saying is that the filter that he put every decision through was, does this please God? And so for all of us who are in leadership here and whatever we're in leadership of, we need to keep asking ourselves, are we doing this for the right reasons? Are we doing it primarily to please ourselves? Are we doing it to please other people? Or is there a great passion here to please God? And that's our big purpose. But there's another one added to it. C.S. Lewis famously once said that the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ and to make them little Christ. And here's the important part. He went on and said, if they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, the clergy, the missions, the sermons, and even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. And Paul would have absolutely agreed with that because C.S. Lewis is echoing Paul. Look at verse 12. Paul says that everything that he's doing is pleasing God and yet there's got another great purpose among the people to urge them to live lives worthy of God, to call you into his kingdom and glory. And of course, living worthy of God is is living out God's character and values in our lives. It's about discipleship. And Paul's saying there, my holy obsession when I was among you was enabling and inspiring and urging people to grow as disciples, to mature in their faith. And I hope that you're reading the book of Thessalonians along with us. And if you're doing that, you're going to come across time and time again, Paul praying that they would grow in faith, they would grow in love. What they have to do to bring their lives into conformity with God's will. So there you are. Why do we exist as a church? For exactly the same reasons that this very first church existed. Growing disciples and pleasing God. That's got to be a holy obsession as a church. And of course, I hope you know this, that our purpose statement is enabling people to become lifelong followers of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the good of the world. Those words aren't just there because it's kind of trendy to have a purpose statement. Or it sounds good on the website. They're there to guide us in everything we do, to remind us constantly that we as a church are about bringing glory to God, pleasing God, and enabling people to become lifelong followers of Jesus, growing disciples. So that's the first thing we've got to get right. Our purpose. The last four or five years at least have been a bit depressing, uh, Almost, it seems, every couple of months there's been a new story about some high-profile church leader who's fallen from grace. And you could probably rhyme off the names. And I think that's why we we need to pay special attention to what Paul talks about leadership here. Because Paul's actually being accused of some of the things that these leaders did. He's been accused of being greedy, of being authoritarian, of only being in it for the money. So what does Paul say? Well, I I love John Stott sums it up really well. He says, the model that Paul sets for Christian leaders is timeless and involves integrity, transparency, humility, and hard work. Wherever you serve in leadership as in this church, our leadership is to be marked by integrity and transparency and humility and hard work. And what Paul says right the way through that passage that Roxanne read read was, he was saying, as a leader, my motives are pure, my methods are above board, and my message is truthful. And that's what we have got to be able to say too. 
wherever we serve. Nothing's changed. Christian leadership is still marked by integrity and transparency and veracity. And that's what you've got every right to expect from every one of us who have got leadership positions in this church. I want to just home in on one verse because it really helps us understand how we get leadership right. Paul says in verse 10, kind of summing up everything else he said about his ministry, you are our witnesses and so is God of how holy, righteous and blameless we are among you. And it's those three words, holy, righteous and blameless. Because they're reminding us that to get our leadership right, we need to get our relationship in three different directions right. And this is what he's talking about here. He's saying that to have leadership right in a church, leaders have to have a right relationship with God. That's what holy means. He's describing leaders who have a relationship with God marked by holiness that reflects God's character because God is holy. The second thing that leaders have to have is among God's people to have a right relationship with them. So it's not simply enough that we have the right relationship with God. We have to have the right, right relationship with God's people. And Paul says that that's marked by righteousness. Quite simply, righteousness is treating people rightly. It's treating people in the same way that God treats them justly, in godly ways. It's treating people in the light of God's values and character. And that's what you should expect. In the church, God's people shouldn't be treated abusively or in an authoritarian way, but in righteous ways. So we've got the right relationship with God. We have to have the right relationship with God's people. And finally, Paul says that we even have to have the right relationship with those outside the church. In the community that surrounds us, he says, in relation to them, be blameless. Now, he's already said that there are things that the community is not going to like about this church. They're going to be persecuted. But what he's saying here is that the things that people should resent us for or point their finger at should be us living out the gospel, not living in ways that contradict the gospel. So in our dealings, in our workplaces, in the places that we study, where we live and among our families that aren't Christians, Paul says, live lives that are blameless. There's a, a New Testament scholar called David Bennett. He did something really interesting. He went through the whole New Testament for his PhD and looked at every single reference to leadership. And he, he wrote a book about it. And this is his summary. What he discovered was that actually the New Testament says virtually true of leaders. Because you see, back then, and as now, some people who got into leadership think it becomes about entitlement. And if you're a leader, it exempts you from some stuff. That's been the problem in so many big churches. But Paul says these standards of honesty and humility and integrity they apply to us all, but especially leaders. Robert Murray McShane was a young Scottish leader at the beginning of the 19th century who had an incredible ministry. Uh, revival broke out all over areas of Scotland through his ministry, but he died at only age 29. And I, I remember reading about him and thinking, I want to discover what it is about his ministry that made it so powerful. And I think I discovered what it was. This is what he said. He said, my people's greatest need is my personal holiness. Can I say to you, whatever position you hold in this church, our greatest need from you is your personal holiness. That 
is what right leadership starts with. How does all of this make you feel? Can I be honest? It intimidates me and makes me feel inadequate. When I see this calling that God has for me, I feel intimidated and at times very inadequate. And that's why we need each other. Some of you might remember that just before Christmas, I sent you out something called Leadership Shift. And it's just a little questionnaire to help us reflect on our leadership. Now, I know that Christmas is busy and everything else, but if you haven't filled that in, do you know I'd really encourage you to do it? Just to reflect on your leadership. In fact, I'll send it out again this week. But here's the important thing. If I feel inadequate and inadequ uh, intimidated, what I need is to be inspired, to do better, to be equipped. And there's something that we've been planning for about 18 months as elders. We've not been able to do it because of COVID and we thought we were all Zoomed out so we didn't want to add in more Zoom stuff. So about every two months, we want to have an evening for about an hour and a half called Inspire, where we inspire each other as leaders, where we help each other grow as leaders, where we pray for one another as leaders. And we're going to have the first one on the 24th. That's a Wednesday here at half past seven. We're going to reflect a little bit on this. Paul and Becky are going to help us think about how to be spiritually healthy as a leader. And we're going to think about some of the plans that we have as a church. I'm going to send out an email inviting you this week. Please, if you can make it, please join us. So we've thought about the right purpose. We've thought about the right leadership. Let's think about something I'm going to call the right posture. It's in this... Is it on the Thursday the 24th? Sorry, Wednesday. Wednesday, have I got that wrong? Wednesday the 24th. No, 23rd. 23rd, sorry. 23rd, if you're watching at home, excuse me, 23rd. I think this is maybe one of the most important verses in the whole of the Bible for understanding how we change. Paul says, you received the word of God, which you heard from us, and you accepted it as not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. In the UK, there's an organisation called the Open Air Campaigners, and these are people who feel specially called to do open air preaching. Uh, you know, in the streets, at big events, and we, we had a pastor's education thing, and we invited one of them along, and somebody asked about, well, how do you attract a crowd? And the, the man told us about one of their evangelists, and what he would do is that he would put his coat down, and then he would jump on it and start shouting, it's alive, it's alive, as if there was something moving underneath. And eventually he'd keep shouting, it's alive, it's alive, until people would gather around thinking, you know, is it a rat, is it a cat, is it a bird? And then he would whip off his coat and pull out his Bible and say, it's alive. And he'd talk about how God's word is living and active. Now, I'm not sure that Paul ever threw his coat down and put a scroll under it, but he certainly believed that God's word was living and active. Do you see what he says at the end? He says, God's word, which is at work in you. You know, a church is only really a church if God's word is at work in it changing and transforming and sanctifying and helping us to be more like Jesus. So how does that happen? How does God's work, word work among us as God's people? It's kind of vital we get this right. Well, traditionally, uh, theologians have said there are three stages. There's inspiration and illumination. So God's Holy Spirit is at work inspiring God's Word. And that's why Paul calls it the Word of God. And you might remember in 2 Timothy, Paul says that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired 
by God. That's what the word of God is. That's what we've got in the Bible. God's word, God's inspired truth. But that's not enough. Just the fact that the Bible is inspired doesn't change anyone. Because we then need illumination. And so the Holy Spirit works to make God's inspired work for you to be convinced of its truth and know how it applies in your life. And that's what we thought about last week. Do you remember the verse? Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. The Holy Spirit illuminating them and saying, this is true, this is how it applies to your life. And that's the outworking of what Jesus described when he said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Now that's God's part in the God's word being at work, but it needs your part too. And that's what Paul is focusing on, what we're calling appropriation. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, and you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. So God's word only works in us when we receive it and we accept it. Now, here's what one theologian uh, describes how that happens. Our knowledge of God comes through God's word. He's caused it to be written, and through it, it speaks to us today. And the Bible is to be received as God's word to us and obeyed as such, and we submit to its authority. We place ourselves under the authority of the living God, and our lives are transformed by being brought into conformity with his will. That's what I mean by posture. The right posture to God's word is a willingness to come under its authority. To say, what it says, I'll believe, and what it commands, I'll obey. Now, let's put it in a way that we'll understand if we are parents. You know, as well as I know, that there's a difference between hearing and heeding. So if you've got children, you know there is a difference between hearing and heeding. They often hear what you say, but that doesn't mean that they're going to heed what you say, does it? It needs hearing and heeding, and that's what Paul says. He says that we have to hear it. He says, when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us. Now, you need to remember, back in Paul's day, people didn't have their own copies of the Bible. It had to be read. So the only way that you received it was by hearing. But of course, it's different for us, isn't it? We've got our own copies of God's word. We can watch it on YouTube. We can listen to it on radio. There's lots of ways that you receive it. But simply receiving it isn't enough. We've got to heed it. You accepted it. And what he means is you accepted it as authoritative. You came under its authority. You obeyed what it said. Listen, here's what it means. You can't heed what you don't hear. We can't heed what we're not hearing and receiving. So let me ask you, how many times did you receive from God's word last week? How many times did you read it? How many times did you hear it? Because you can't heed what you're not hearing. But that's only half of the equation, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter what you hear if you don't heed. Isn't that what James meant? Do you remember what he said? Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. So God's word works in us when we hear it and heed it and come under its authority. And the final thing we need to get right is fellowship. I was reading about a survey. It was very interesting. It was first done in 1985. And it asks people on a questionnaire, over the last six months, who are the people with whom you've discussed the most important things in your life? And in 1985, 59% of the people who filled it in listed three or more people that they could discuss the most important things in their life. 
And so what they, they did was they repeated that survey now after COVID or kind of what we hope is the end of COVID. And the most common number of friends with whom people would discuss, you want to guess what it was? Zero. Zero. 25% of people said that they had no one, that was the biggest percentage, that they could discuss their life with. And so the author said, one out of every four of us is walking around with no one to share our lives with. And that means some of us here tonight, and some of you listening on live stream, have no one that you can really share your life with. And that is such a tragedy, especially among us as God's people, because Paul says exactly the opposite. The word fellowship isn't mentioned in these two chapters, but it's probably the best description of fellowship in the whole of the New Testament. And if you want to understand what fellowship is, what real Christian fellowship is, and how it happens, it's verse 8. And Paul says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. And in fact, in the Greek, it says that we share the depths of our soul with you. Because you became beloved to us. We might say today that he bared his soul. He was completely open and honest with these believers about what was going on in his life. And his relationship with his other believers was marked by authenticity and vulnerability. We used to have, when I was in Bible college in Manchester, older retired ministers in to speak to those of us who wanted to be pastors and they would share their wisdom. And one of the things that the older pastor said was, don't ever make friends in the congregation. Uh, you, you can't have friends because, and you don't want to show your vulnerability. Now, I kind of understand that they didn't want pastors to make cliques in churches, but I fundamentally disagree because of this. It doesn't matter who we are. We are called to share our very lives with one another. And you know, when we do that, amazing things happen. I don't know if you notice that the language of family is just shot through this whole passage. Mother, father, children, orphan. This is how God's family works together. And Paul said, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, we cared for you. We loved you so much that we shared our very lives. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging and comforting and urging and night and day, we pray most earnestly for you. They were creating a culture of love, of care, of encouragement, of comfort, and prayer. And you know, I was preparing this week, and as I read those, my mind went to our life group two weeks ago. And people just shared what the tough stuff that was happening in their lives about problems in relationships and about bereavement, about all sorts of tough stuff. And as we did that and we expressed our care for one another and prayed one another, despite the fact that we were on Zoom, God's presence came powerfully to every one of us. I'm amazed after just a month, despite all the persecution that Mark had done, everything Satan could throw at them, Paul said, you're standing firm in the Lord. How were they able to do that? Well, if you've maybe been to Colorado, you'll see these amazing aspen forests that are up on the mountains. How do they stay when the soil is so thin because their roots are intertwined. They give each other strength. 
How did these new Christians stand firm? Because their lives were intertwined. How will we as a church stand firm? Only if our lives are intertwined. And you know, that can't happen here on a Sunday night. Probably this church was about the size of one of our life groups. And can I say to you, if you're not connected to other believers in this kind of group that intertwines your life, where you can share your very life, you're not living the Christian life as it's meant to be. So we've thought tonight about what church is. How do we do it? I've not got time to look in depth, but I hope you remember these core commitments. Let me tell you, if we commit ourselves to these, the stuff we've talked about tonight will happen. If you're committed to being here so you can hear and receive God's word, if you're committed to having a time alone with God so that you can hear it and allow God's spirit to work with you, if you're committed to being part of a small group, to grow in community, if you're committed to growing in service. Let's pray that we become the kind of church that Paul describes here. And we're going to end by singing some songs that help us do that now.